This is a podcast produced by Visionaries Norway. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us for this second episode in our second podcast season. As usual, my name is Thomas Tett, and I'm the one recording and producing these episodes. Questions, comments or feedback, you can follow us or contact us through our Facebook page or check us out on the web at www.visionaires.no. In this second episode, we're going to keep going where we left um, and the topic is still the parents. And Daniel Kish is here to keep talking about this subject. So just grab your coffee, tea, whatever you prefer, rest back and pay attention. So in the previous episode, you laid out uh, some major uh, principles um, for, you know, parents, how they can uh, interact or work with, with their blind kids. So maybe now we should get a bit more into the practical, you know, what you do, how you do it. But maybe, so maybe you want to start with going over the principles again and, and, and go from there. Sure. So... <clears throat> To summarize, uh, we, I, I want to say first that the principles underlie everything else. If you get the principles right, everything else tends to just fall in place. So, mm. so we have the cake. I'm about to apply the icing. Uh, but really, uh, the principles are, in my view, the most important thing. Right. Um, the first really is that parents are the most important instructors for our children. Um, what instructors do really maybe constitutes about 10% of a child's growth. The rest of it, uh, for better or worse, comes from the family and from parents. So uh, parents really need to take the lead in the instructional process and the families are the blueprint for the child's community. Um, who the child becomes, how the child interacts with his or her surrounding community really is very, very much influenced, virtually dictated by the relationship they had with their family. Um, the next is uh, what I call freedom first, which is the idea that freedom drives the developmental process. Children grow and develop in order to find their freedom in their lives. So freedom is the driving force behind development. And I say that because very often we as educators and as society delay, we put off freedom for our blind children. We will say things like, well, uh, a blind child shouldn't use a cane until they're six. Or a blind child shouldn't you know, start moving around on their own until such and such an age, or this needs to happen before we can expect a blind child to start to, to have freedom in their lives. And that is just, it's just not a developmentally sound um, approach to take with a blind child or any child. And the next would be uh, a, a principle of development as well as neuroscience, use it or lose it, which has to do with brain mechanisms. It has to do with uh, everything we do uh, starts with the brain. You cannot fool your brain. Your brain knows everything you're about to do. So, so uh, even freedom of movement, every choice we make, every uh, intention we have, every idea about where we want to go and and what we want to do is dictated by actual real mechanisms in the brain. And if those mechanisms are not used, they are lost. They, they either don't develop or they, or they either atrophy or they don't develop. So um, when it comes to freedom of movement, self-navigation, self-directed achievement, uh, anything having to do with uh, exercising our intention, uh, and action, 
uh, has to do with brain mechanisms. And if those are not used, they are lost. So if we're over-supporting, over-guiding, over-structuring, over-modifying, over this, over that, if we are basically um, over-managing a blind child or over-managing the environment around a blind child, we're simply inviting well, we're failing to invite those brain mechanisms to develop. We're actually inviting them to atrophy. And the last bit is need drives learning, which is similar to the idea of necessity being the mother of invention. When we need something, when there is necessity for something, we find a way to uh, invent it or create it or put it in place. And so uh, children tend to learn what they need to learn need is the best teacher. So if a blind child always has a hand to hold, an arm to hold, if they always have someone to support them, guide them, direct them, protect them, etc., the need to develop the skills to keep oneself safe, to protect oneself, to guide oneself, to navigate oneself, to develop one's own relationship with one's own environment on one's own terms, simply isn't there. There's no need to drive the learning process. So <laughs> consequently, blind children don't tend to learn what they need. Don't tend to learn those skills if the need is not in place. Mm -hmm. So what are those skills? What are those abilities that we're talking about? Well, those skills and those abilities tend to develop as a natural consequence of the principles I've just outlined. But what are they in practical terms? And what can we do, aside from, you know, right thinking and right philosophy, to help these skills develop? So I, I said in the earlier podcast, um, the earlier episode, that <clears throat> if it were up to me, I would have canes in the hands of newborns. Mm -hmm. I would be teaching newborns clicking, really, you know, using echolocation. Uh, in a language model. Uh, children learn language, they learn to talk. If they learn to talk, they learn to click. If they can learn to click, they can learn to communicate with their environment in the manner that echolocation allows. So, um, so we don't wait for cane training. We just get a cane in the hands of a child. And COMD, um, C-O-M-D-E, uh, they have a child-sized cane. Mm -hmm. uh, that you can order in any length. I actually helped develop that cane through an organization in Germany called Andersen, um, which uh, now uh, makes these child-sized canes available, they're, and they're quite nice. Um, also, Sferovsky, um, which, is, which operates out of the Czech Republic, they will make canes of any size for children. And um, as a rule... Of, as a rule, I, the idea of, of giving a cane to an infant is to provide them with a means of connecting with the surrounding environment. So if a blind child, for example, is using their cane and they're kind of feeling around and their cane you know, I have one here, actually, mm -hmm. and this one's, well, this one's probably longer than I would give to a, a baby, but not much. Um, and uh, it happens to be a Swarovski cane, but I have others. And so a blind child's on the floor, and they're maybe on their back or their tummy, and they are feeling around, and then, you know, it, it finds something. Okay, well, this something sounds very different from this something, or this something, you know, or this something. Mm -hmm. And to a, or this, I mean, very interesting. So with, <laughs> without moving my body at all, yeah. using a cane that's not even a meter long, I have just found about six different things, all sounding different, all feeling different through the cane. And what I have just done is effectively what a sighted child would do by looking around and taking interest 
in what's around me. I get to choose. Do I want to find this, or this, or this, or this, you know? And what do I have to do to, to get there? And so one of the things that we, f so, so, the, so they'll move the, the cane around and they'll find stuff. And then of course it's, it's playing with a child in much the same way that you play with any child and, you know, getting them kind of piquing their interest in moving or, 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 or um, motivating them to, to, to roll or crawl or do whatever they have to do to get to the thing. I often do it with their favorite toys. So I'll cheat. I'll put their toys just out of reach, you know. <laughs> they have to go and get them. And they have to go and get them. And they have to, and they have to use their cane to kind of find them. Um, and so uh, what we find is a couple of things. First, we tend to find that the blind children take interest in their environment. They will engage in directed reaching more often and at an earlier age uh, if they have this in place to motivate directed reaching, directed movement. Um, and they will begin walking earlier. They'll begin walking sooner than a blind child who doesn't necessarily have this piece in place. Um, so the typical early interventionist, I, I, I do not honestly know how it works here in, in Norway, so I'm speaking from my experience in other countries is, yep. is early interventionists, you know, they have a wonderful philosophy about coming in and providing children with experiences to help them meet their developmental milestones so that they're more ready for school when it's time for school. And that's yep. a great philosophy. And many of them have fantastic, a fantastic repertoire of activities and knowledge. And, and, and I, I do not, um, deny this. What I often find, however, is that um, they'll come in, maybe with some frequency, and uh, they bring lots of activities, and they, they bring activities for the blind child to do, or they'll bring the blind child to various activities for them to do. And by the age of about six, these blind children are very chatty, they're often very bright, they're often even you know, rather curious, um, and they often are well spoken, and they have good language development, and they seem very smart, etc. But they can't execute movement. Mm -hmm. They can't direct their own movement. They don't have freedom of movement. They don't. They're, so they're quite dependent on someone to bridge their connection with their world. Mm -hmm. What we find is that if a blind child can just move, if they just, if they have that freedom of movement already in place from an early age, in a way, they are their own, they become their own early interventionist. They, they access their own environment. They learn what they need to know on their own terms. Now, there's always going to be a place for early interventionists. So, you know, that, what that basically means is the early interventionists can then come, come in to a blind child's life at a much higher, more sophisticated level. Because the basic piece, the foundational piece of freedom first, of self-directed achievement, is already done. Mm -hmm. So now we have the capacity to teach a child much more. Um, so the cane for a baby who's not quite walking should, in my opinion, in my expertise, I won't go into all the science, there is science around this, maybe we can do a podcast about the science. Yeah, that's another you know, that be Very interesting. <laughs> but um, uh, trust me when I say that the cane should be about 50% longer than an infant. So if your infant is, you know, oh, centimeters, good heaven, is about 50 centimeters long, then the cane should be perhaps around 75 centimeters mm -hmm. long for a baby who has not yet been walking. Because, first of all, the baby can manipulate that cane, okay? Babies are incredibly strong for their size and weight. And so even though the cane is quite long, they can move it, and they will move it. And the second thing is they really need an opportunity to reach well beyond themselves. So that 50% extra length 
uh, gives them the opportunity to reach well beyond their immediate body space. And it gives them the, the concept of, oh, you know what, there is something outside my immediate reach. And I know it's there, you know, because I, I, I found it. I, there it is. Yeah. So let's go. Mm-hmm. And uh, as a child is about to reach the point of ambulation, and you'll be able to tell they're, they're, they're pulling to stand, you know, they're moving their legs, they're, they're beginning to cruise along the furniture. In fact, we call it cruising, so they're using furniture. Um, I would then not keep the cane 50% longer. I would let, I would let them grow into the cane. Um, you don't necessarily have to shorten the cane, but just let them, let them grow into the cane. They're going to, they're going to grow fast anyway. So let them grow into the cane. And what we find is that cane speeds up the development of walking. Mm -hmm. Um, for two reasons. One, it's, it's provided the motivation to get up and walk. The other is, uh, well, three. The second is it provides them with a sense of security. So they're no longer moving into just space, space unknown, you know, un, you don't know anything about the space you're moving into. Now, if they're in their own home, it may not, you know, it may be less important, but I would, I would still have the cane be available to them, even in their own home, and then how they use it will evolve. But if, if there is any doubt that a young blind child should have a cane, and there are all kinds of, of, of reasons that people will put forward for a blind child not to have a cane, um, none of them are developmentally sound. And again, maybe another podcast to explain that. They are not developmentally sound, trust me. When I say this, um, I do have reason for it. Uh, All you have to do, grown-ups, is slap on a blindfold and see how comfortable you are getting around without something to give you what we call feed-forward information. Information about where you are going. Without that feed-forward information about the space ahead of us, the space we are going into, most grown-ups are uncomfortable to move. You don't have to imagine too hard what that feels like. So you're not going to move around uh, unfamiliar space uh, or maybe even familiar space if you don't have some way of knowing what's ahead of you. So that cane provides an infant or toddler with that same information. Why would we withhold the means of accessing that information from a blind child when we ourselves, as a grown-up, would want that information, would need that information to feel secure and indeed to be secure and and move about effectively? It doesn't make sense. And I, as a blind person growing up, pretty much in that same situation. I, I wasn't given a cane until I was, well, 10 or 12. Um, uh, I, I can say from experience that although I had developed my echolocation at a very, very early age, my whole mobility situation would have been quite different and much improved if I'd had access to a cane when I was very young. Um, so the cane provides security and it provides this feed forward information. The third thing is that what we find with toddlers who are just beginning to walk, and it's said that blind children take longer to learn to walk. Um, Yeah, I mean, on average. Uh, But when they have access to a cane from a very early age, not only do they learn to walk sooner, but they learn to walk in a ma- manner that's more stable. Their, their, their balance is better. And why should that be? I mean, they're not necessarily using their cane like a shepherd's staff. They're not using it to balance themselves. All right. However, vision provides, vision contributes to balance. 
just by virtue of providing a third point of reference. It's almost like having a stool with three legs versus a stool with two legs. That third leg gives the stool a point, an additional point of balance. Vision kind of gives you a sense of what lies ahead of you a few, by a few steps. And then it, it's because you have that feed forward information, your body just writes itself. The cane provides you with the same thing. So I often find that if I have a blind toddler and they're a bit unsteady on their feet and I provide them with a cane, just using that cane in a more or less traditional way, meaning that they're using it to kind of feel ahead of them, they're not using it to lean on, they're just using it to feel ahead of them, their balance will improve and their posture will improve uh, pretty much every time. So, and my answer to that is that they're receiving information that clicks the brain into activating those balance mechanisms in much the same way that vision does. So, so those are the main things about the cane. And as children uh, become toddlers and they begin walking, and I said earlier, let them grow into their cane, at that stage you want the cane to remain about as long as they are tall, maybe up to about their foreheads in length. The cane tip should land nearly one body length, so their own body length, ahead of them. So kids will hold the cane by their side, uh, and so uh, as they're walking, the tip should land, um, well, about three steps, really, ahead of where they are. And as they get older, we can reduce the length of the cane a bit because kids can extend their hand a bit. But that's, that's the main rule. So, so that's, I would say that that's a critical piece to get canes into the hands of children, blind children, as, as early as possible. I mean, none of us would ever say a sighted child should be delayed in when they learn to see mm. <laughs> because sighted children aren't responsible for using their vision responsibly and effectively until they're older, that would just be silly. Uh, blind children should learn to use, should have their canes available to them at a very early age. Will they be using them perfectly? No. Uh, but it will be functional just as a sighted child's vision is functional, if not perfect. So in fact, a sighted child will spend 20 years developing their visual system. So, um, why not provide the cane at an earlier age? So the next thing uh, with regard to movement and mobility is, well, we'll, get, we'll just say it's echolocation. Um, how do we get young blind children to, to start using echolocation? And that's a developmental process, meaning that it doesn't happen right away any more than language happens right away. How long does it take a, a, a typical child to, to learn language? It takes time. Uh, it doesn't all happen all at once. So I do two things here. One is uh, I, I often teach the parents how to click. Uh, we can't get into all of that. We did a clicking episode earlier, mm. so see, see previous episode on clicking. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, children will mimic that. They'll copy that. That's what children do. They copy what they hear. Um, my nephew was actually clicking. We were playing click games back and forth at each other uh, when he was six months old. Uh, even before he could learn to speak, he was learning to click because he heard his uncle doing it. So um, if we model how to use clicking, which is to say this is how we look around. So look around. We look around. We turn our heads. We turn it to the right. We turn it to the left. We click over here, over here. This is how we find where a corner is or where... Uh, an open doorway is, or, you know, we can play lots of different games. I mean, that might be another podcast episode, but we can play lots of different games with our kids by using clicking or by hiding sounds um, and teaching them to, to turn their heads and look around um, for those sounds. Until a child learns to click, we often use these hand clickers, and they're, they're basically wooden castanets. They're, they come from um, Suzuki Music 
warp. Um, and I often put, uh, I, I tie these onto the top of a child's cane, or you can clip them to their clothing somewhere. And um, they are very easy to click and they can, I mean, these clickers are quite special in the kind of information they provide. Sometimes blind toddlers will just, just instinctively get it. They'll start clicking and they'll start noticing that, wait a minute, I do hear, hear something. Um, or we as parents can use the clicker, again, to model how it's used. Um, I think where to get these is or will be on the Visioneers Norway website yes. somewhere. So, um, so, so it, this is almost instant result. If, if a blind child has access to one of these clickers, again, putting it on the top of their cane is nice. You know, it, it works. Um, and they don't have to fish for it and they don't, they don't lose it. It's always there. It's always available. Um, it's a bit like the difference between trying to see when the lighting is never good versus seeing when the lighting is good. These clicks make good lighting mm. for effective echolocation. That is the difference. So why would we keep our blind kids half blind by lack of lighting when mm. a nice, good, effective click brings out that lighting? Um, <clears throat> another area of the mobility piece, the movement piece, the freedom of movement piece has to do with how do we not guide our blind children? We're all taught how to guide our blind children. Every last one of us learned somewhere how to guide a blind child. Mm. I'm not sure how that happened, but it's just universal practice that we all learn how to guide a blind child. It must be, I mean, <laughs> that says something that we all learn how to guide, but we are rarely taught how not to guide or why not to guide and so uh, the model I use here is kind of a social a social emotional model it's it's equating a blind ch child's need to a sighted child's need to know where his or her people are that's a very basic child need. Where is my mommy? Where is my daddy? Where is my family? Where are my friends? Where are the people I know and trust and feel secure with? Um, that's paramount to any child, usually any healthy child, and it is paramount to most blind children. So, I mean, the easy way of knowing where your people are is to just hold on to them or have them hold on to you. However, uh, that's not conducive to the kind of brain development we talked about earlier. So, yes, it's age appropriate to hold our child's hand. I'm not denying that. However, we need to be mindful that a blind child, a blind child will not let go of our hand when they get older if they do not have the skills uh, and need to do so. They'll just hold on until they're teenagers, you know, or older. So, um, we have these bells and they're not just any bells these are falconry bells these are available from the uk but they're probably available from europe as well and not just any bells are i mean not all bells are created equal um, you want bells that ring very very easily when moved so you you clip these to your trousers or to your uh, maybe to a purse or to a pocket and as you move naturally the bells just kind of jingle. Um, these are cat bells, so same idea. I literally picked these up at a pet store. Falconry bells are more effective, but cat bells aren't, are usually good. Um, and you just, your blind child will learn to tune into these bells from dozens of meters away. So they just know where you are. And no one else pays much attention because most people are just busy going about their lives and can't be bothered mm. to notice things that are outside their scope of interest. It's remarkable how unobservant people are. Um, and so, but your blind child will not be unobservant. Your blind child will be very focused on where you are by 
this sound as you move through public. So if it's a quiet place, it's easy enough to just keep conversation with your child. Of course, they can hear where you are. But when we get into to, to more and more congested places, public places, shopping centers or the like, and you want to try and get out of the habit of just grabbing your child and pulling them along all of the time, um, the more they feel comfortable moving on their own and the earlier that comfort level develops, the better. So these bells are a great way to do that. I remember one situation uh, where we had a, I was working with a family with an eight-year-old who had really never moved on his own. And he was very, very anxious about moving really anywhere, even in his, his back garden, without someone to hold on to or someone to direct him. And uh, by the second day of working with him, we went to a busy farmer's market, which is a place where they sell produce, fruits and vegetables and meat. And it's an outdoor market and it's quite bustly and it's quite crowded and lots of people going hither and thither. And, and um, I put one of these falconry bells on his mom, his dad and his younger brother. And he was already starting to move on his own at that time. And he kept up with them very well. But there were occasions he would still say, I'm scared, I'm scared. And then I would ask him, well, where's your mom? Where's your dad? Where's your family? Where's your brother? They all had different bells on them. And immediately his brain would turn to that awareness. And once he realized very easily where they were, he just immediately became calm and, uh, and focused on the process of, of keeping track of where his people were. So, so this process of not holding on to him all the time and dragging him along or having him hold on to someone um, gave him a lot more autonomy, gave him a lot more freedom about, knowing, about, about where he goes and how he goes there. Um, so moving into the social skills, if you will, the social aspect of being able to get around, a lot of this is social mobility and social, um, engagement are, are, they go hand in hand. They're, they're pretty integrated. The more mobile we are, the easier we find we can keep up with our friends find our friends, go where they go, do what they do without, frankly, without being a burden on them. So, uh, but to do that, we have to be able to engage people. And uh, one aspect of that is making, we'll call it eye contact. And do blind children make eye contact? Well, I mean, they can. I, I refer to it as how we direct our, how we direct our energy. It's like magnetism. You know, two magnets align; they pull at each other. So when we look at each other, we're directing our energy, directing our attention at each other. A blind child is every bit capable of directing their attention at each at others in in ways that others are aware that they're doing this. We would expect this of our sighted children. If you want my attention, sighted child, you have to do some work to get my attention. You have to make eye contact. You orient your body a certain way. You orient your head a certain way. There's a, there's, there's a, a certain posture that you use to, make, to, to engage my attention. And every sighted child learns to do this at quite an early age. So with blind children, I, uh, I suggest that we indicate to them when they have our attention and when they do not have our attention. So if their head is down or if they're spinning around or if they're weave, waving their head back and forth or whatever, or if their hands are in front of their face, they're not doing what they need to do to get our attention to engage our attention. And so I might say, I don't know who you're talking to. Are you talking to the floor? Are you talking to the ceiling? Who are you talking to? I don't know where you're, where, I don't know 
I don't know whose attention you're trying to get. Look, when they're three years old, that may make, not make a lot of sense. But when they're four or five years old, it starts to make sense pretty quickly. And, and we're doing them a favor by requiring them to engage our attention. Um, when, and, and they'll want to talk to us. They'll want to get our attention. So the need is there. Um, a next big part of this is physical development. Blind children are commonly uh, underdeveloped, underhealthed, if you will. Um, they, they are often not engaging in the amount of physical activity that other children are engaging in. And that may be because we are overprotecting them from doing so. It may be that we don't have systems in place for them to do so. It may be that they don't really want to. Whatever it is, I'm here to say that it is not because of blindness that blind children are routinely less healthy than sighted children. It is simply because uh, we haven't afforded them or extended to them the same opportunities to be physically engaged or physically involved. So uh, here is a matter of looking at a sports model where they're able to participate, where they have a, a ball, for example. Most sports have some kind of ball or moving projectile or something that we're keeping track of, uh, or targets that we aim at. And if we can audify the ball, in other words, make it make a noise, or a target that can make a noise, then blind children can learn at quite an early age how to interact with these targets more effectively. Um, or, I mean, team sports are great. I, I, I certainly recommend them. But you don't necessarily have to participate in a team sport in order to be physically active. I, for example, was a climber, and I could climb anything and everything. And any opportunity that a blind child has to climb, for example, is, is fantastic. Swimming is another great one. I mean, there are many, many different things that we can involve our children in and should think about involving our children in to keep them healthy because as a blind person you will be more physical you must be more physical you will be walking more places you'll be carrying stuff more places you need to get places in a timely manner the train is not going to wait for you the bus is not going to wait for you so you need to be able to get there um, and you're out in the elements Whereas a sighted person might just jump in a car and be driving, um, a blind person's not going to do that. So, and they're going to be carrying their groceries on their back coming home. You know, I mean, the more physical we can, we can help our blind kids become, the better off they'll be. It's a simple matter of, you know, kind of evening the playing field. They're blind; they can't see. But if they have stronger bodies, stronger minds, stronger spirits, then of course they're just going to be better off. So the main issues here really are what can we do to help our blind children improve their mobility, their ability to move around, which means early cane training, early echolocation, early ability to know what's around them and how to interact with what's, what's around them. Um, the social piece of how effectively they can engage people. How effectively can they get people's attention? We know that little blind kids are really cute and they engage grown-ups' attention quite easily. And we make all kinds of accommodations as grown-ups, and we all do, to allow ourselves to be engaged by a little child. But then you watch, okay, fine, but how effectively can they engage the attention of other children? And often the answer is, you know, they're not quite as good at that. Sometimes they are, but often they're not. And so we as grown-ups owe it to them to model the need for them to do the work that every child has to do to engage our attention. Um, and then the, the final thing I would say is physical development. Being physically able to... Uh, participate with our peers, to participate with the community, to be healthy, to be active, 
um, to be a part of of the community and of society. It it often takes physical capacity. If you are blind and you lack health, then you just have a double problem. So I take physical development very very seriously, and that's those I'd say are are kind of the main issues around the skills, helping our blind children develop the skills to be effective. You have listened to a podcast produced by Vision Natives Norway. Please follow us on Facebook or check out our webpage at www.visionaries.no if you have any feedback or want to support the work that we do. Thank you for listening.